Remember to subscribe to our Zoom Catchers YouTube channel and follow us on our socials. Greetings and welcome to this continued conversation on aging. I'm your host, Kimberly Gunn, Executive Director here at Zoom Catchers. You know what we say, we're never too young to think about aging. We are super excited to be joined today by Dr. Dilip Jeste to have this conversation, The Science and Art of Aging, and Dr. Just Day's CV is super long and super impressive. I'm only going to touch on the highlights and we'll have him go deeper into that. Dr. Just Day is the former Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care and Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Just Day obtained his medical education in Pune and psychiatry training in Mumbai, India. He has published 14 books including his most recent book, Wiser. He has been a TED Med speaker, and his work has been cited in international media, including Time, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Juste to the Zoom Catchers at Virtual Studio. Good morning, sir. How are you doing today? Really well, thank you. Thank you. How is the weather in San Diego? The weather is... Beautiful, <laughs> as it usually is in San Diego. I also want to thank you, Kimberly, for inviting me to be on this really important show. Great. Thank you so much. So like I said, your, your CV is quite impressive and very long, and I just touched on the highlights. So if you could please just tell us more about how you got into studying this, this topic of aging and the science of aging and wisdom, which we're going to continue to explore. And in particular, I read or I watched in the series of interviews where when you first started to study, some of your colleagues thought you were a little off track with this topic. So if you could tell us more about that, that'd be great. Yes. Thank you, Kimberly. As you said, I was born and grew up in India. I was always interested in brain and mind. I loved reading Freud's books on interpretation of dreams, interpretation of everyday errors of life, and things like that. And Freud believed that the mind really was a function of the brain. And I thought that was fascinating. And that's why I decided to go into psychiatry. And I was also very interested in a research career. And that's the reason I moved to the US, because this is the mecca of research, especially in medicine. When I was growing up in India, I realized that uh, like most Eastern cultures, there's a strong belief that older people bring a lot to the society. Older people are respected. They are thought to be wiser. It was believed that there is such a thing as wisdom and that increases with aging and that is why we should care for and listen to older people. Decades later, in the US, I became a geriatric psychiatrist. When I first told my friend that I was going into geriatric psychiatry, they said, why are you doing that? It will be so frustrating and depressing because what is old age? Old age is all gloom and doom. Everything declines with age. Physical health, mental health. With aging, we develop diseases, disabilities. There is dementia, depression, various other conditions that reduce the joy in life. And then we die. So aging is all gloom and doom. It's very pessimistic. Why are you? going into geriatric psychiatry. And that is very different from what my beliefs were when I was brought up in India, which was that older people are wiser. They are to be respected. So I felt that these are two diametrically opposite views. One says 
that aging is all bad, and the other says aging is all good. What is the truth? And can we find that out scientifically? Not with any personal bias, but based on scientific evidence. And that's where I decided to study not only aging, but study wisdom. And since then, I have found this topic markedly interesting and fascinating. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you so much for, for that, that wonderful intro. Because you, you, know, you touched on a topic that I wanted to just explore a little bit more. And that is some of the cultural concepts around aging. I've had a chance to spend many opportunities in, in Asian countries, in particular China. And they probably have a similar idea around aging that Indian society has where Older people, elders are held in high esteem and are respected. And I wonder if you could just talk about that versus, you know, the American ideas of, you know, everyone's often looking for that fountain of youth and very youth-oriented society. Yes. I think for many centuries, people, especially from the Eastern part, have believed that aging is good, that aging is associated with greater wisdom, resilience, positive attitude, and older people are so helpful to the younger generation. But in the modern Western culture, which is more materialistic, there has been emphasis on youth, health, and beauty. And older people don't meet those criteria, according to them. Now, When we talk about health, people typically think only about physical health. And that's why, as you said, younger people, they're thought to be in a fountain of youth, right? 20s and early 30s. People are at their best physical health. And there is no question that physical health declines with age, especially after the age of 50, 60 or so. We develop diabetes, hypertension, greater risk of heart disease, cancer, and so on. So there is no question that physical health is at its best in younger age and starts declining in older age. However, physical health is not everything. Even more important is mental health because Ultimately, what everybody wants is to be happy, to have a higher level of well-being, right? And that happiness and well-being is a part of mental health. Physical health and mental health then don't go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, they often go in opposite directions. What I call paradox of aging. We did a large study of several thousand people from age 20 to 100. What we found was that as people got older, the physical health started declining around the age of 50, 60, and then went down. Mental health and well-being, on the other hand, went exactly in the opposite direction. 20s and 30s, the fountain of youth, right? That's the period of the greatest level of anxiety, depression, and stress. And we can imagine those of us who are over a certain age, then if you look back in our young years, teenage years, or 20s, that's a pretty stressful period. There's a lot of peer pressure. We want to do the best we can and often feel that we are not as good as our peers are. There are many important decisions to make. What education to pursue, what, where you settle in, whether you take up a job. And consistently the feeling is that we are not doing well. So 20s and 30s are really a period of considerable anxiety and stress. But the good news is that things start getting better. They don't get better in terms of stress. There is stress throughout life. The way we handle stress changes and improves with age. 
as we get older, we learn how to tackle the stress and how to feel better. So an 80-year-old in a wheelchair is much happier than a 20-year-old perfectly healthy person who is depressed and sometimes suicidal. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's what's just so interesting about, you know, your your belief system around uh, around aging. And I think it's, it's so counter to what a lot of people believe, belief systems that a lot of Americans might have is gloom and doom. And oh, my God, I'm getting older and my gray hairs are showing and I won't be able to, you know, live a, a, a healthy, ha- happy life. And happiness seems to be linked with youth and, and you know, the younger years. And I wonder if you could go deeper into the idea of what you consider successful, healthy living. Give us some some pro tips. Give our audience some ideas about what um, what your science and what your research is indicating. Sure. So when we talk about successful aging, the question that comes up is who defines successful aging? Who can tell me whether I'm aging successfully or not? In the Western culture, that is often based on physical health. And so people look at you, and if you're physically healthy, they say you're successful. If you are disabled, you're not successful. That is wrong. Because I am the one who should decide if I'm aging successfully. You are the one who will decide if you are aging successfully. Others can't tell us, right? And people... As they get older, they define successful aging by the level of happiness that they have. So older people may not look successfully aging to others who see them as having hypertension or diabetes, as I said, even being in a wheelchair. But for older people, there is a lot of happiness. They are delighted that they have not only lived through the age of 80 and beyond, but they have a wonderful family. They spend their life time doing something that was helpful, that they liked. They raise a family. They have a large circle of friends. They are happy. And that is what is successful aging. So successful aging is something that the person defines for herself or himself. And that is usually based on wellness, well-being, and happiness. It is not best on physical health. It is not best on the money you have or other properties you have. It really depends on your level of happiness. And that's, thank you for going into that because I think we have mental constructs about these ideas. And, you know, once that gets set in people's minds, it's probably hard to break out of that. What their idea is or what society's ideas of healthy, happy aging would be. And I wanted to talk more about the idea of social connectivity and social connections, because I know you've spent time exploring that and researching that as well. And how does that relate to healthy, happy aging? Social connections are very important. There is a lot of research that has shown that social connection has greater impact on health and longevity than almost any other medical risk factor or protective factor. So social connections have greater impact than treatment of hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity. You name the various physical conditions that are disabling and obviously they reduce the longevity. However, if we have good social connections that can overcome the effects of those disabilities. So it is not actually the number of social connections that is important. It is the quality of social connection that is critical. For example, a young college student is living in a dorm surrounded by 100 other students. He has 1,000 Facebook friends. So his social connections are very wide and broad. However, most of them are not positive. On the other hand, an older person who is living with her or his spouse or partner, so they don't have too many social connections, right? And yet the quality of the social connection is so good. 
that they feel happy. So what is important is the quality of social connection. But it's critical to have some social connection or connection that are positive. They'll contribute to better health and greater longevity. And, you know, that that's just a, an interesting, you know, concept that you're talking about, um, the quality versus the quantity, because we know so many people have hundreds of friends, but, you know, still feel loneliness or still feel like they're not connected to their society. And that leads me into the the concept of of um, living, because I've read and watched many of your, your interviews and, and read some of your materials. And your idea that um, for us to continue to be successful with, with aging and dealing with the issues around aging, that housing is going to be one of the key solutions to that. And also, in particular, multi-generational housing. I was wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah, sure. But as I said, older people who live with their spouse are often happy, although they have physical problems. They have some of the social issues, financial issues that they have to face. And when the spouse or partner dies, then of course the things become much harder. So senior housing communities have sprung up in the country and in the world. And I think that is good because older people that way are provided with not only space to live, but the social connections that they would have. Also, you are well taken care of in terms of any emergencies that may arise. If somebody has a fall, develops a stroke, immediately they can be rushed to the emergency room and so on and so forth. There is also usually healthy food that is available. There are opportunities for physical activities that are there. You don't have to worry about repairs in your house, for example. So there are lots of good things about senior housing that reduce the stress on you, and that also makes the family happier and they feel more secure about their older relative. However, the downside of senior housing community is that it kind of excludes older people from the younger generations, except when they're visited by the younger relatives. And I think there is a downside to that, that what we need are intergenerational activities. Numerous studies have shown that intergenerational activities are helpful for both the generations. That is because they have complementary skills. For example, younger people, clearly they are at the top of their physical health. They can also learn things faster. What is called psychomotor speed physical speed as well as speed of thinking, they are higher in younger age than in older age. Younger people can learn new things more easily than older people. That's why they're so good at technology, whereas older people have difficulty with technology. On the other hand, older people, and we'll talk about that when we talk about wisdom, older people have more empathy, compassion, self-reflection, control over their emotions, and they can help younger people navigate the stresses of life much better than younger people themselves can. So intergenerational activities are very helpful for both the generations, not only psychologically, but also physically and biologically. Studies have shown the biomarkers of stress and aging go down and people if they have adequate intergenerational activities. So I would suggest and I would hope that in future there'll be more and more intergenerational communities and not just senior housing community. Yeah, and thank you for going into more detail about that. And I do remember that there is a couple of models out there that are providing these types of hubs. And I wonder if you could just mention those or you know, let our audience know about where they might be able to see some living examples of that. Yeah, I think, again, it varies a lot right now. The senior housing community has grown a lot, which is great. But there are it's a lot of variation. There are some communities that are called continuing care housing communities, where people move in there when they're healthy and they can be only in the 50s and they can move there. 
and they stay there for a long time, possibly for the rest of their life. When they start getting physically disabled, they move into assisted living facilities. And if they develop dementia or other serious cognitive problems, then they move into memory care. So those are the three parts, the independent living, assisted living, and memory care. So that itself starts with somewhat younger people, people in the 50s and people in the 90s also would be there. There are some universities now that are trying to have communities that are also having housing for the students. So undergraduate or graduate students, so their dorms can be close to the senior housing or they can even be part of the same building. And that's really very helpful. And this model actually has been used somewhat more often in Europe in countries like the Netherlands. But I think it is beginning to happen here and I just hope that it increases. So younger and older people will have more interactions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up that point about the Netherlands. I think I, I read that in my research as well. And, you know, that leads me to my next question of how do you think we as America are tackling this this issue? I know that 2030 is a year that a lot of people are talking about in this field. It's where a huge percentage of the baby boomers are going to be 65 years and older. So we have this 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 time, this date that's barreling towards us. So what would you, how would you characterize our response to these issues around senior living and, and aging in general? Sure. So one thing that is ha- happening practically all over the world is that the number of older people is increasing. That has been increasing for decades and it will continue to increase in near future. And that is actually good news in a way. However, the way the society reacts, especially I worry about the economic side. The economists think about increasing the number of older people as what they call silver tsunami, as if that's a disaster. Why it is a disaster according to them? Because older people have more health problems, physical health problems, and they need more healthcare, and that is more expensive. So they think about this increasing number of older people as a crisis for the society. Our healthcare costs are going up. That is their complaint. I really think that is wrong. And that is wrong not out of sympathy for older people or compassion for older people. It is wrong because the evidence doesn't support that. There are better ways of handling that. If we can keep older people active, they will stay healthier for a longer time. Their healthcare costs will go down. Older active people can help younger generations. And right now we are facing some problems with the younger generation. The rates of suicide, opioid use, and other unnatural deaths have increased a lot in younger people especially in the last couple of decades. So if we keep older people active and help them work with younger people, we will improve the health of older people as well as younger people. That will bring the healthcare cost down. So I feel that the way the U.S. and some of the other Western societies are approaching aging is really counterproductive. That's, that's so interesting. And you have the data and the research to support your, your, your thoughts and your beliefs about that, which is, which is great. Would you say, though, that with 2030 approaching that the stakeholders in, these, in this issue are starting to think about it more or are, are we just continuing to, to plod along or what's your how do you gauge the, the, the response? I'm very hopeful that things will change. They have to change. The society cannot continue to function the way it is. And people are realizing the value of older people to the society. To give you an example, during the COVID, so when COVID started in 
early 2020 in the US. You know, the initial reports were all about older people dying, especially older people in nursing homes. So the only talk was about the deaths in the nursing home. And that was true that older people are more vulnerable to complications of COVID requiring hospitalization, ICU, and dying. And the society's interest in older people and their care made some politicians say that we are doing something wrong. Some people, and this is official statement made by some politician. They said, why are we wasting money on these 80-year-old nursing home people with dementia? How long are they going to live? We should use that money for helping the younger generation. And sure, we should help the younger generation, no question about that. But I said to myself that let these people wait till they reach 80 and let me think, let me see what they think about aging and care for the aging. So during COVID, the expectation was that older people will psychologically do much worse than younger people because there are more physical complications, right? Also, they didn't know how to use technology. They didn't have access to technology like the younger people had. So when the social distancing was necessary to stem the spread of the pandemic, for younger people, it was not a major problem that way because they had FaceTime, Facebook, Twitter, and what have you. Older people often didn't have smartphones, FaceTime, etc. They also frequently don't have social media. So they suffered from more social isolation than younger ones. And yet, older people handled COVID much better than the younger ones. There's a paper that was published that found that anxiety, depression, stress were five times more common between 18 and 25 years of age than people over age 65 five times more common in younger people, in spite of the fact that they are much better physical health and they could use technology much better than the older people did. That really shows why the wisdom, resilience, and perspective of older people are helpful. And that is literally the perfect segue into the next part of our conversation. And thank you so much for being here. We are with Dr. Dalit Jaste, and we're talking about the science and art of aging. And we're going to move into talking about wisdom, you know, because I'm not a scientist, but I can imagine that you've lived 70, 80 years, you've, you've clocked all these hours and years and you've gained some wisdom and you have a lot of experience to draw on where someone who's 14, 15 doesn't have that same track record. So let's talk about wisdom and what, first of all, what is wisdom? Because I think people have an idea of, you know, some, some older person sitting underneath a tree meditating and, and that's what wisdom is. But so what is, how would you define wisdom? Yeah. Wisdom is an ancient concept. Practically all the religions and philosophies mention wisdom. And that is going back to the antiquity. Bible uh, in Hinduism, Gita, and all the other religious documents that talk about wisdom. And one of the problems actually in science has been that people have said that wisdom is not a scientific concept. It's a religious and philosophical concept. And that's why when I started studying wisdom, again, some of the scientists said, you shouldn't do that because nobody will take you seriously. Wisdom is not a scientific concept. And I took that as a challenge. I said, no, that wisdom can be studied scientifically. I'm not the first one to say that. Scientific study of wisdom started in the 1970s at Max Planck Institute in Berlin and University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. And the research in wisdom has been growing. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is a personality trait. It's a personality trait like resilience, optimism, extroversion, introversion. You know, this describes characteristic pattern of behavior in an individual. For example, extroverts, they meet with 
and spend time with lots of people, introverts are more to themselves. So wisdom is a trait like that, but it is a complex trait. It has several different components. One component is empathy and compassion. That is understanding other people's emotions, sharing other people's emotions, and helping them. Empathy and compassion. Then comes control over emotions or emotional regulation. Think about a teenager. His emotions fluctuate hour to hour and minute to minute. And think about a wiser, older person who is calm, collected, doesn't get ruffled easily. So that's an example of emotional regulation or control, but with positivity. So there is no ecstasy, but there is happiness and well-being. The third component is self-reflection. Ability to look inwards, trying to understand ourselves. When something goes wrong, instead of blaming others or blaming the environment, one can say that maybe I did something wrong. Let me think about that so I can do better next time. Those are the three main components of wisdom, but there are also a few others. One of them, which we are sadly lacking today, is acceptance of diversity of perspectives. That means I may have strong values about something, but I can understand why somebody else may have different value system. I don't have to agree with that person, but I can accept the fact that people can have different opinions, different perspectives, different values. That doesn't mean that one of us is evil or dumb. So that is acceptance of diversity of perspectives. Another one is social advising. A wise person doesn't keep things to herself or himself, but also helps others when they call for it. And last but not least is probably spirituality, although spirituality is somewhat controversial. Not everybody thinks that spirituality is a component of wisdom, but many people do. Spirituality is different from religiosity. You can be an atheist and still be spiritual. Spirituality means feeling connected with something or someone that we don't see, whether we call it God or spirit or soul, doesn't matter. But we feel connected with something or someone and that makes us feel happier with greater well-being. Great. Thank you so much for that the definition of wisdom. And, you know, I would imagine that people might confuse intelligence with wisdom. And I was wondering, how would you distinguish the two? But that's a very good question. People often do that. The difference is that the intelligence refers to quality and quantity of the things that we value in our usual life, such as reading, writing, arithmetic, or the professional skills. They become important. However, wisdom is more than that. Wisdom is more than IQ. People, obviously, you need some intelligence to be wise. You need the brain being reasonably well integrated to be wise. However, there is no direct correlation between IQ and wisdom. People with the highest IQ are not necessarily the wisest people. For example, if you think about terrorists and mass murderers, they don't lack intelligence. Their IQ is often high because they have planned so many things in advance. The problem is that their goal is to hurt others, destroy others. These are not wise people. They're intelligent, but very unwise people. Often in a family, the wisest person is a grandma who didn't go to college. She's wiser than her grandson, who may have five different degrees. So it is not really the IQ or education that matters. It is really wisdom that matters. And, you know, that's such a, a great example because there are so many intelligent people out there that aren't necessarily doing good for society or making contributions. And based on your description, it, you know, I get the impression that for you, wisdom also includes a strong component of 
caring and compassion and, and empathy. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would say that is the single most important component is empathy and compassion, understanding other emotions and helping them. But also I should add that it also includes self-compassion. You also need to care for yourself. The example I gave is when we are flying, you know, in the security video, they said, put on your own mask first before helping others. And that's really an example of how we also need to take care of ourselves if we are to help others. Sometimes I've seen people who are very compassionate toward others, but they're very harsh on themselves. That's not good. Because if you are feeling too guilty all the time, blaming yourself, then they'll come in the way of your ability to help others. So clearly you need to be empathic and compassionate toward others, but also toward yourself. You, you heard it right here, folks. Take care of yourself. Put your, your oxygen mask on first and then go out there and look after others. And I know that's so hard for, for, for many people to wrap their minds on around, but, it, but it's, uh, it's true and it plays itself out often in life. If you don't have anything to give to yourself, it's hard to, to give to others, really. Awesome. We are here with Dr. Dalip just today and having a fascinating conversation about the science and art of aging. And continuing on with the topic of wisdom, based on your research, is wisdom a part of the brain? And if so, where is it found exactly? Where is that wisdom part? Sure. So wisdom is a personality trait, as I mentioned. And the personality traits are obviously psychological, social, but they're also biologically based. Typically, 50% of a trait is biologically determined, determined by the genes we are born with. But the other 50% part of the trait is determined by environment and behavior. So we have to study the biology just as we study psychology and sociology. So we spend quite a bit of time looking at the biological components or biological relationships of individual components of wisdom. And there's quite a bit of literature on brain imaging, for example, in relationship to empathy and compassion or emotional regulation, or their opposite. For example, antisocial personalities, they lack empathy and compassion, and their brains show some differences from healthy people's brain. Also, there are examples of people who had a brain injury. These were people who were wise to start with, but then they had this head injury, and after that, they became totally unwise. There is also a disease called frontotemporal dementia. This disease, one variant is called behavioral variant, and the symptoms of that variant are exact antithesis of wisdom. So something happens to parts of the brain that can make a person unwise. What are those parts of the brain? So without going into technical details, I'll say that the prefrontal cortex and limbic striatum are the two most important parts of the brain from the perspective of wisdom. And this is really interesting because prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain in the evolution. It is what makes us human. On the other hand, limbic striatum, especially amygdala, is the oldest part of the brain. Almost any animal that has a brain has a amygdala. So what wisdom means is really combination of the oldest and newest parts of the brain. And that is why it is so useful for the society. And it's just, it's just so fascinating to, to ponder that, you know, there's actually a part of the brain where, you know, where wisdom is, uh, is found, so to speak, for lack of a better word. And, you know, that leads me to my, my next question is, do, because I think for, for many people, they think the older you get, the wiser you become. So my question is, does wisdom increase with age? And if so, how does that exactly work? Sure. That's a great question. And that is something people have been studying for a long time. And so, so in general, yes, I think wisdom tends to increase with age. But there are two important caveats I want to mention first, and then I will talk about how it may increase with age. 
one caveat is that different people are different as they age. They age differently. So not all older people are wiser. Actually, there are some older, older people who are very unwise and some younger people who are very wise. So it is not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? The second part is that wisdom does increase with aging. However, up to a certain age, we reach a certain age at which, say, dementia may take over or something else may take over that reduces the brain functioning. And then, of course, it cannot increase. So once we accept those two caveats, we should try to understand then why wisdom increases with aging. There are both psychosocial reasons and biological reasons. Psychosocial reason is experience. We all know that experience comes with age. And experience teaches us something. One of the reasons why older people did well in COVID was because some of them said, we have been through crisis before. We have been through recessions, depressions, droughts, wars. We survived that. So we know we will survive this one too. Younger people never had such a bad experience. And that's why they had difficulty dealing with it. So experience, bad experiences especially, but good experiences too, teach us things and experience comes with age. Right? So that's an important reason from a psychosocial perspective. From a biological perspective, as I said, typically with age, there will be some decline and degeneration all over the body, including the brain. However, in people who stay active, active physically, mentally, socially, cognitively, in people who stay active, the brain continues to evolve in older age. You know, we think about childhood as a period of growth and development. And we think about old age as a period of decline and degeneration. That's not true. That's very simplistic. Both things happen throughout age. In younger people, there is some degeneration and decline. On the other hand, in older people, there is growth and development. Obviously, there's more growth and development in younger age and more decline degeneration in older age, but there's also growth and development. So people who stay active, the brain continues to be plastic. So there's something called neuroplasticity of aging, that the brain can continue to grow in the sense new synapses form, new blood vessels form, even new neurons can form in some regions of the brain, not everywhere, but in some parts of the brain. And that is a neuroplasticity of aging in people who are active. So the reason for increase in wisdom with aging in people who are active is that there is continued growth development that occurs in their brains. Did you hear that, everyone? Stay active and, and keep the, the brain functioning and uh, listen to a wise scientist who, is, who has a Plenty to say about this topic. And once again, thank you so much for, for being here. This is such a great conversation. I'm learning so much, and I know this will resonate with, with many people out there. Now, I did want to have you comment on how you feel that we can teach wisdom. I know you, you know, strongly believe that wisdom is important for, for maintaining society and advancing humanity in general. How would you recommend that we actually teach teach the concept of wisdom and help us all you to improve our society and our lot in this world. Sure. So that relates to your earlier question, Kimberly, about intelligence versus wisdom. What we do today is totally focus on intelligence and specific professional skills. For example, as a medical student, we teach students how to be the best diagnostician, how to be the best prescriber. We don't teach our students how to be empathic, compassionate, how to have more self-reflection, how to have control over our emotions and be happier, how to accept diverse perspectives. We must teach these things to them because that will improve their well-being. Wisdom is good not just because it feels good, but wisdom is associated 
with greater well-being, greater happiness, which leads to better health and perhaps greater longevity. So it is our responsibility to teach these qualities and value them. You know, we give prizes for the people who have done the best in their field. But we don't give awards for empathy, compassion, emotional regulation, self-reflection, accepting diversity, so on and so forth. We need to change that. In sports, only the person who wins all is valued. What about sportsmanship like award? Why don't we use that at major championships? And that is what is needed for the society because over the last 30 years, our society is experiencing what I call a behavioral pandemic of loneliness, social isolation, depression, anxiety, suicides, drug abuse. The CDC data show that the rates of suicide increased by 33% in the year before COVID hit us. The rates of opioid-related death have increased tenfolds in the last 20 years. You know, we of course know COVID as a pandemic, obviously, it killed millions of people and it lowered the life expectancy. But how many people know that the average life expectancy in the US fell before COVID? It fell in 2016, 17, 18. That's the first time since the mid-1950s that the average lifespan in the U.S. dropped. It didn't drop because of some infection or cancer or heart disease. It dropped because of loneliness-related deaths from suicides, opioid-related deaths, so on and so forth. And so this has become a major social problem. Gallup polls consistently show increase in levels of anxiety, anger, hatred, stress, in the last 15, 20 years. So we need to do something to change the society's well-being. And that will happen if we fight these, this behavioral pandemic with what I call the vaccine for loneliness, which is wisdom. Mm -hmm. Our studies have shown, clearly shown, we have published several studies, including thousands of people, that wisdom and loneliness go in opposite directions even biologically, people who score higher on wisdom are not likely to be lonely, which means that they are less likely to be suicidal, less likely to have opioid use, less likely to be depressed, anxious, or stressed out. So we need it for our own sake to teach wisdom to various groups starting at a very young age. Awesome, awesome commentary. And those statistics are so heart-wrenching to hear, actually, because we would hope that we'd be moving in the opposite direction as we're advancing as, soci as a society, that collectively we'd be living longer and healthier and happier, but that isn't bearing itself out necessarily in that way. And, you know, you did mention, or I've heard you mention how wisdom, like true wisdom, has a heart component. And, and I was wondering if you could expand on that. I know so much of of the study and research is on the brain and neurological underpinnings of that. But you also mentioned the importance of, of the heart, heart connections. And what do you mean by that? So I mean, biologically, the, for the nervous system, the second most important organ is heart. Because the heart obviously monitors and manages the blood supply to various tissues, including the brain. And people who have heart disease, they may have a stroke, and which will clearly impair the brain functioning. But does that even need to be stroke? People with heart disease will have less blood supply to various tissues, including the brain, and that will have some impact. But I also use the word heart in a more colloquial fashion, talking about soul, talking about spirituality. There is a lot of literature showing that things like meditation and mindfulness have a positive effect on health. 
and not just psychological health, but physical health and biology. For example, meditation and mindfulness have been shown to increase the white matter integrity in the brain. They have been shown to reduce level of inflammation in the blood and increase the cell life through what is called telomere and telomere is an enzyme. So, the things that are associated with wisdom, including empathy, compassion, happiness, emotional regulation, self-reflection, they improve functioning, not only of the brain, but of the body as a whole. And that is something we need to do, not only at individual level, but also at the societal level. As they say, it, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a, a lot of wise people. <laughs> so let's, let's all come from that place of uh, keeping an open mind and, and a compassionate heart. And hopefully we'll continue to, to get there. We are here with Dr. Dalip Juste. We're talking about the, the science and art of aging. And I want to now shift into talking about technology and the, the tech component. And how do you see technology playing a, a role in aging and assisting with alleviating some of the problems that we experience as we age or enhancing our lives? Sure. But the technology really had changed our world. I mean, in a way, we saw that during COVID when the social isolation was necessary. And, you know, just like this particular conversation we are having on Zoom, we hardly ever used Zoom before COVID. And there is also now in health, the telemedicine has become so common. And I think that is actually good because if you look at the population growth, there are, uh, I just read that the population has increased close to 8 billion. And from the health perspective, the number of healthcare practitioners is far too small to treat 8 billion people personally. So we have to have technologies help. So when you talk about technology, it is useful not only for health, but of course it is useful for transportation. We can fly across the world in a very short time. Communication across the world has become so much easier. Now, you know, in places like India and some of the other countries, it was very hard to get telephones. But now with the smartphones, even the poorest people can communicate with one another. So technology has been helpful. Technology also has a downside, no question about that. We see that in social media, for example. So the social media increase suicides because of the bad messages that are given. So technology can be used positively. It can be used negatively. And what I think we need needs to happen is just like as I was talking about humans, that intelligence is not enough. We need wisdom. So, so far, the technology, the focus has been on artificial intelligence, AI. The idea was to create machines that would be very smart, and that has indeed happened. You know, some of these computers, they can solve very complex problems that would take humans years to solve. The computers can solve them in seconds. The computers can beat human ch champion in chess or jeopardy, and so on and so forth. But that is only intelligence. Intelligence is not enough. What we need are components of wisdom, such as emotional regulation, empathy and compassion, self-reflection. So can we teach the computer these things? Well, let us think about the individual components. Emotional regulation is not a problem because computers don't have emotion. Right? So we don't have to worry about that. Self-reflection and self-correction. It is the computers already do that in a way. Some computers, they can learn from the user's mistakes and they can improve that. Right? It is not, it does not reach a high level, but it can do that. Empathy and compassion is something that is obviously lacking. And that brings us to actually the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can we teach our machines diversity, equity, and inclusion? I feel that yes, we can. Not to the same extent as humans, but to a considerably greater extent 
right now we are not even paying attention to instilling those skills in the robots. If we can teach our kids, we can also teach most of the computers many of the skills. And I think that's something that needs a collaboration among computer scientists, neuroscientists, philosophers, ethicists, physicians, and others. But we should all get together and think about how we can make the robots not just smart, but also wiser. They won't be able to be as wise as human wise people, but they can definitely be wiser than what they are today. There's such an interesting idea of, of the robots becoming wiser. Can you elaborate on what that would look like, a, a wise Mr. Roboto? How would that play itself out? Sure. You know, first of all, I want to say that robots are becoming useful in many societies, especially those with larger number of older people. For example, in Japan, robots have become a common position of older people, especially for people who are by themselves or even when they are with their partner or spouse who is also old, they need help. And the robots can help them today with things like reminding them about taking their medication, doing physical exercise, so on and so forth. I think that is where the usefulness of wise robot will become clearer, that they will help older people make right decisions, which is quite helpful because as people get older, the cognitive function also declines to some extent and to varying level in different people. So people do need help. And right now, the help that is given is strictly from the intelligence perspective, which is helpful, but not adequate. Older people are often subject of scams, for example, by other people. So can a robot help detect a scam? I personally think so. They can. Again, not every scam, but some scam. They will be better able to do that than the older people themselves. And this is just one example. Again, this is something that is going to require a lot of work on the part of lots of people. And But I don't think we should look at it as science fiction. I think it is a possibility. You know, we accept, you know, we watch all the movies in which the robots go into space and they fight and so on. But not we think about robots that actually are wiser and that, that are helping. It is, it is definitely a possibility. I would say it's more than a possibility. It's a feasibility. It's a likelihood. If we put our heads together from different specialties, and again, it is not going to change things overnight, and the robots are not going to be as wise as humans, but they can be much wiser than they are. Let us just focus on something more than intelligent. Let us go beyond AI and go to artificial wisdom. That is so interesting. You heard it right here, folks. We're moving beyond AI. We're going into AW, artificial wisdom, where we have how the computer is acting compassionately. And, and it, it, that is such an interesting idea to ponder. My mind is like, wow, what the, this is fascinating. So, And for all you tech people and all the stakeholders, which is pretty much everybody, it's like, let's hold that thought. What would a wise robot how would that play itself out in our society? Wise robotics. Love it. Love it. Perfect. We are getting to the end of this fascinating conversation. We have covered so much brain, hearts, robots, healthy living, healthy aging. It's been wonderful having you on. I do want to talk about your, your book, Wiser, that came out in 2020. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. What was your, your inspiration to write that book? So I've been doing research on wisdom for 15 plus years. And I've written a number of articles, given talks, but they were all addressed to scientists, psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, neuroscientists, and so on. And as I became increasingly aware of what I said was the behavioral pandemic, 
that has been surrounding the world for the last 25, 30 years, realize that actually this is something that lay people also need to be involved in. This is something that is evidence-based. And again, we are learning. Things are improving. But there is enough evidence to suggest that wisdom is a real thing. It has specific components. It has a biological basis. We can increase wisdom in individuals. And we know that in science, but we are not practicing anything. And it has implications for healthcare as well as education and even the healthcare economics. So I thought it was important to reach out to the general public and write a book for the public. So I teamed with Scott Leffey. He is a brilliant writer. Scott is the director of communication at University of California, San Diego. And we have worked together for a number of years writing on media or press releases for the scientific papers. But we both thought that well, we could team up to write a book that was for general public. Because although I can write, my, most of the writing is intended for scientific audiences. Whereas Scott the expertise in reaching out to the general audiences. And so we teamed up and uh, with the help of the publisher, we got this book out. And I'm delighted that there's now something out there People can look where they can study, they can see what wisdom is, how to measure it in themselves and others. It includes a scale called San Diego Wisdom Scale that people can take for themselves. And it also includes ways of getting wiser. How can you improve your emotional regulation, self-reflection, empathy and compassion? Not just in older age, at any age. So this is something we believe is use, should be useful for people of all ages. Great. Thank you so much for being here. It has been a great conversation. We've covered a lot of terrain. Hopefully these audiences will, will take this information to heart, learn more about what it means to pursue wisdom and, and, and think about a healthy living and successful aging. Really appreciate you being here. And my last question is, what is next for Dr. Dalip Juste? I know you retired, but I'm sure you're not sitting still. So what's next for you, sir? Yeah, so I retired from UCSD. I was there for 36 years, but not at all retired from research because that's something I thoroughly enjoy because I learn a lot in the process. So what I'm now focusing on is what you alluded to earlier, social connection, and which is a part of social determinants of health. Social factors that affect our health and longevity. They include social connections, but also on the other side, discrimination. Discrimination in the form of racism to, towards immigrants, people who are homeless, and so on. So there, there are strong biases that occur that in societies, and this is not just in the US, but all over the world. But clearly, these have become more prominent in recent years and that are affecting the health and longevity of the population as a whole and some groups in particular. And I think these need to be studied and we must find out ways in which we can address them at individual level and at the societal level. And that's why I'm increasingly interested in the social determinants of health and I'm working with scientists in various different areas from basic neuroscience to anthropology, to public health, to primary care, psychiatry, rest of medicine, and also people from across the world, people who were part of the WHO, those who are with the CDC, NIH, as well as many of the major universities and organizations, such as the American Psychiatric Association in the US and the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK. And I find this increasingly exciting that we all can put our heads together to understand what the social determinants are and how can we do things that will change the adverse effects of the social determinant so we all will be healthier and live longer. Great, great. You heard it from the, the expert himself. Let's 
figure out how we all as stakeholders can continue to learn more about these topics and improve the outcomes for all of us as a society. Dr. Juste, it has really been a profound pleasure to have you on the show. I can't express enough how happy I am and thankful and grateful that you've been here to impart your your wisdom and all your years of knowledge and expertise on this topic. My last question is, will you come back and, and get us updated on where you are with your latest project? I'll be delighted to. And thank you, Kimberly. Also, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Your shows are really terrific and you're doing a wonderful job in reaching out to people, educating them about different aspects. And so I commend you on that and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap, folks. We have been here with Dr. Dalip Juste talking about the science and art of aging. Continue to support this topic and join us for the next conversation with another guest. And we will see you next time. Bye.